Well, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me this uh, challenge and opportunity. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is some uh, more recent methods and uh, perhaps more recent understanding of older methods concerning calculating Galois groups. And um, because of um, limitations of time and uh, the speaker, I'm not going to be able to speak give you a survey of all the new methods. Um, looking around the room, I see people whose methods I won't be mentioning, and I hope they forgive me. Um, the um, organization of the talk will be as follows. I, I want to describe some algorithms that certainly are algorithms that calculate Galois groups and is the case with uh, many theoretical algorithms. There's nothing wrong with them. But when you try and use them, you know, they don't work. They, not, not in real time. So um, I'd like to talk then about uh, what, what does work, what people do use. And finally, uh, since differential Galois theory is, is my field and it's been mentioned already, I'll take the uh, opportunity to talk about calculating differential Galois groups. So, um, well, let's start calculating Galois groups in theory. Everybody, yeah, that's legible. Um, I guess one should really first ask, can, can we calculate Galois groups? Is there an algorithm? And um, there's a two-word answer, yes. So I, I want to spend some time talking about each of these words. Um, as far as yes goes, yeah, there, there's, there's an algorithm. And in fact, I mean, it, it probably goes back further, but, but the source that I know uh, is uh, Kronecker's uh, Grundzüge of eine uh, Arschmettete um, Theorie der algebraische Größen. <laughs> And uh, he presents uh, the following algorithm. It's very easy to describe. So let's, let's start with a polynomial with rational coefficients, degree n. And I'm going to assume it has simple roots. That is, it has no roots in common with its derivative. So this is a polynomial in one variable of degree n. The thing that uh, Kronecker suggests is that you form a new polynomial. It will be a polynomial in n plus 1 variables. Um, and it's, it's got, gotten in the following way. You take the roots alpha 1 through alpha n of your original polynomial, multiply alpha 1 times x1 plus alpha 2 times x2 and so forth, and then you look at all permutations, all those linear expressions for all permutations of the roots. So you look at now at the polynomial r, it's a polynomial in y, whose roots are all these, what I think of as uh, generic uh, primitive elements. So it will be a polynomial of degree n factorial. Okay? And uh, if you think about it a little bit, you didn't really need to know what the roots were. The coefficients of this polynomial will be symmetric functions in the roots, and so they can be expressed in terms of the coefficients of my original f. Okay, so started with a polynomial in one variable, degree n. Now we have a polynomial degree n factorial in n plus 1 variables. Okay. The next step is to factor it. So you factor it over the rational numbers. And Kronecker gives, gives an algorithm to factor this. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, but but he, he gives an algorithm to factor this. And then you take one of the factors, let's say R1, and you look at the permutation, permutations of the x variables that leave it fixed. And that's your Galois group. Okay. So um, I'm not going to try and justify it, but uh, I, I do want to say a few words about this. Um, to start with, from a practical point of view, it's a disaster. It's really a, a total 
catastrophe. So you start with a polynomial, let's say, of degree 10, in one variable. This r is degree n factorial, what that's about 370,000. So you have a very large polynomial. And then you're going to factor it. And um, Kronecker's idea for factorization, so you have some polynomial um, r of y, x1, xn. He's going to replace the variables with, let's say, a new variable to a uh, power uh, n to the i, where n is something bigger than the degree of r. So this will be n factorial again, raised to the i power. Do the same thing with y. You'll get a polynomial in one variable of, well, just unbelievably large degree. So, um, but, but it, it's an algorithm. It, uh, and, uh, you know, Kronika was quite careful about this, and, and it, it really does give an algorithm. But the, the point I want to make is that it, it has high complexity. So um, I, I've given you a vague idea of what I mean by high complexity, but, but one of the themes in the 20th century, going into the 21st century, was a, a formalization of the notion of algorithm, and along with that, a formalization of the notion of complexity. So um, I'd like to spend some time about thinking about the complexity of algorithms to calculate Galois groups. And the, the measure of complexity I, I want to use is uh, what's known as uh, polynomial time. So i just say a few words about this. Um, the question I want to ask is, is there an algorithm to compute the Galois group with running time that's a polynomial in the size of f? So I've, I've made these words uh, in red. And I want to define them a little more by size. The way we measure the size of an integer is not its size, but just the length, the amount of space it takes to write it down, the number of digits. I'm not going to worry about which base we're writing it in, just say base 10. So that's about log, log of the real size of the integer. And then a rational number, its size, let's say, is the size of the numerator plus the size of the denominator. And for a polynomial, its size is n times the, si the maximum size of the um, coefficients. So the size of something is the space it takes to write it down. That's the idea. So what do I mean by running time? Well, running time, it's going to be the number of operations. And to be honest, I should just think about operations on digits. But if you want to think about just general multiplication or addition, that's fine. So now the question is, is there an algorithm to compute the Galois group of an equation whose running time measured this way is a polynomial in the size of the input? Well, that's not a fair question. Because you can have a, poly a polynomial of degree n, relatively small coefficients, but the Galois group will have size n factorial. So your output isn't really polynomial in the input. So just to even write it down would take too much time. On the other hand, if you have a, a group of some size, let's say size m, uh, it's not hard to see that there always exist log m generators. So if the group has size n factorial, there's something like constant n log n. Um, generators. So one, the, the right question to ask is, is there an algorithm to compute generators of the Galois group whose running time is polynomial? And this would be a modern way of trying to capture finding an algorithm that isn't too complex. And now that I've posed the question, I can tell you that I can't answer it. So um, we, we don't know. And I think it's a very interesting a problem in algebraic complexity theory. Now, uh, Harold Edwards uh, showed us this uh, quote of Galois, uh, where, where it's apparent that he understands that um, 
although he, he can tell you what's going on with uh, solving a polynomial in terms of radicals, he can't give you a method that's practical. So he has some sense of uh, uh, understanding what's the difference between some theoretical approach and some practical approach. And uh, in these modern terms, uh, we, could, we could formalize this and, and ask the following question. So is there an algorithm to decide whether a polynomial is solvable in radicals? Who knows? Maybe you could do this without calculating the Galois group. There may, that may be possible. And in fact, the answer is yes. And this was given by Landau and Miller in 1985. And um, in their paper, towards the end of the paper, they very proudly give the following statement, which is why I didn't translate Galois' statement. Um, perhaps with a little bit of hubris, but they, de they deserve to be proud. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about the Landau-Miller algorithm. What, what has happened since Galois that, that lets them do this? So um, let's see, talk a little bit about the ingredients of this Landau-Miller algorithm. The, the first and for me most important ingredient was um, the discovery by Lenstra, Lenstra, and Lovash of a way of factoring polynomials in polynomial time. This was really uh, a remarkable achievement. Uh, this is uh, polynomials in one variable. Um, Kronecker suggests to factor a polynomial, you, you evaluate it at integers, factor the integers, and then uh, interpolate possible factors and test whether these interpolated polynomials divide. And, well, you have to take some exponential number of combinations and try this. And uh, the lenstra lenstra lovash algorithm avoids, it doesn't approach it quite that way, but it avoids this, this exponential number of choices that you have to test. But I, I, again, I don't want to, to go into the details of it. Um, using this algorithm, uh, Susan Landau, was able to show that you can construct splitting fields and compute the Galois group in a time that's polynomial in the size of the input, the polynomial itself, and the output. So this is already an improvement on Kronecker. Kronecker, no matter what size of Galois group this polynomial has, Kronecker had us calculate a polynomial of degree n factorial. Even if the uh, polynomial had trivial Galois group. But Landau says that uh, to calculate the Galois group, if it's small, you don't have to do that. You don't have to go all the way to n factorial. And um, just quickly, let me show you where the lenstra lenstra lovash algorithm comes in. So um, uh, again, Harold Edwards described uh, this, this situation, you take a polynomial, it's, it's easy to uh, symbolically adjoin one root to the rationals. You just take the polynomial ring, you mod out by the ideal generated by the polynomial. I'm, I'm assuming the polynomial is irreducible for now. And calculations in this uh, field, Q of alpha, can be done using the Euclidean algorithm. It's, it's not hard. You don't have to know what alpha is. So that's, that's the first step. But at the second step, you already have a problem. If you want to construct the splitting field, what do you adjoin? You have to adjoin another root. And in order to, to, to do the same thing, you have to know its minimum polynomial. And so to, to know its minimum polynomial, you will need to factor the original polynomial over this extension field. Well, the lenstra lenstra lovash algorithm, it's easy to, to, to make it work over finite extensions, or at least reduce to the rational case. So at this point, you need a polynomial time algorithm to factor. So you factored, and then you adjoin another root. You factor, and you adjoin another root. 
And you do this until everything is factored. And at that point, so, so it's, it's the, the Lenster Lenster Lovash algorithm that gets you to that point in polynomial time. Um, polynomial in the size of the group, since of course the degree of this big field is that size. And then it's not hard to find a primitive element, the minimum polynomial of a primitive element, and the Galois group is the set of permutations that take this primitive element to another root of its uh, minimum polynomial. Okay, so um, this is uh, Landau's uh, algorithm. And in fact, at this point, we can decide if an equation, an irreducible equation, has an abelian Galois group. And let me do this because the, the um, ideas come up again as I describe the Landau-Miller algorithm. So, so the first thing to observe, so we have our polynomial f of x, g is the Galois group of f. Um, I, I want to note that if g is abelian, then, um, well, what does g abelian mean? All, all groups will be normal. So all subfields of the splitting field of this will be normal. In particular, when I adjoin one root, this will be a normal field. I'll get all the roots. So that's something to keep in mind. So in particular, the splitting field will have degree n. So, so what is the algorithm? So the algorithm is, is you, um, you form uh, the first step in the way to the splitting field. Um, and uh, there are two possibilities. So is this the splitting field? So does F split? And if the answer is no, the game is over. It can't be abelian. So you ask again, does F split? Now, and you get the answer yes. Well, then you have the splitting, then, then now you have to test whether the group is abelian. This doesn't work in the other direction. You have the splitting field, and Landau says, well, you can, you can construct the Galois group in this case. The size of the Galois group is going to be n, size of the, the polynomial. And uh, where you have it written down, you can certainly check if it's abelian just by multiplying in both directions. So this, this, at this point, we can check whether a group is abelian. Um, how do we look for uh, whether the group is solvable? Well, we need some more information. The uh, first step is we need to be able to look at a group and see if it's solvable. And Sims in the 70s uh, gave an algorithm to, to do that. Again, it's polynomial in the size of the group and the size of the equation. Um, so there were two ingredients here. One was that if G is abelian, uh, it must be small. And the other ingredient was I was able to test whether it was abelian. So here we can test whether it's solvable. And um, it turns out that in certain cases, solvable groups have to be small as well. So Palfi in 82 showed that you have a solvable transitive subgroup of the permutation group. And it's primitive. Primitive just means that uh, as a permutation group, it doesn't move blocks of things around, doesn't permute blocks. Then its size is, is small. It's uh, n to less than uh, n to the fourth. And what uh, Landau and Miller did was they showed that if you want to decide whether an equation has solvable Galois group, they were able to construct some auxiliary equations that they knew had primitive Galois groups. A priori, the Galois groups were primitive. 
and that it would be enough to test whether these auxiliary equations had solvable Galois groups. So how does one do this? You have an equation. You know that its Galois group is primitive. You start constructing the splitting field. If at some point you, you, in your construction, the size of the splitting field, its degree, is bigger than n to the 3.25, the game is over. It can't be solvable, so you stop. Otherwise, you'll get the splitting field. It'll be relatively small in size, and Landau's original, the first algorithm, will, um, together with uh, SIMS, will let you test whether it's solvable. So th there's some new, new, new um, tools in the game. One is this very, this good way of factoring things, and the other is we now know more about groups. Okay, so that's, that's the Landau-Miller algorithm, and um, it's a polynomial time algorithm. I, I forgot to write down bounds on the degrees of the polynomials, but in any case, um, I don't think one wants to program this. So, so what does one do in practice? And um, the answer is many things, but um, I want to describe uh, what, a couple of things that, that, that work, and these are uh, things that actually are used, for example, in the computer algebra system, magma. So the first is mod p techniques. And well, we've heard a lot about mod p techniques, but uh, I'm going to look at them uh, from the point of view of uh, algorithms. And um, so I'm going to start with a polynomial that has integer coefficients. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume that the leading coefficient is 1. And we all know this expression for the discriminant. And the, the, the first fact to realize is that, uh, except for some finite set of primes, if you look at the equation mod p and look at its Galois group, one can think of it as being a subgroup of the Galois group over the rational numbers. And, uh, well, certainly the number theorists in the audience know this. This was uh, part of what was spoken about yesterday. Um, but I, I can't resist giving a, a proof of this fact, so I will. And, um, it's, it's a very non-canonical way of thinking about things, but very much in the spirit of Kronecker. Remember that Kronecker said that uh, the, the Galois group was gotten by looking at this enormous polynomial, factoring it, and taking one of the uh, irreducible factors, and looking at permutations that leave it invariant. Well, we could factor it mod p. In mod p, it's going to be the same story. You take one of the irreducible factors. Well, take this r11 and look at the substitutions, the permutations of the x's that leave r11 invariant. Well, if they leave r11 invariant and these other factors have no, no roots in common, it's going to leave r1 invariant. So a permutation mod p will give you the permutation and characteristic zero. So um, at least this, this identifies the um, Galois group mod p um, with, with the Galois group uh, in characteristic zero. So now the question is, what kind of information does that give you? How much of the group in characteristic zero can you capture mod p? And uh, Boy, there's a lot of work done on this. this the Chebotarov density theorem is, addresses this issue. Um, but, but an earlier result, and perhaps at least for me simpler to state, uh, also will give you the, the sense of it. And this is this old theorem of Frobenius. So the theorem of Frobenius says, take the degree and take a partition of the degree. So write it as a sum of integers. And um, you can ask, well, you take your polynomial, and uh, it, it may factor mod p. Look at the primes for which it factors into polynomials of those degrees. Okay. And 
the density of those primes, the ratio of, of the primes for which that is true over the set of all primes, is precisely the percentage of elements in your group who, when you write them as uh, in terms of uh, cyclic permutations, the cyclic permutations have those lengths. So factorization mod p, the percentage of, of p's for which you get a certain kind of factorization, tells you the percentage of elements in the group that have a certain decomposition in terms of cycles. And uh, the Chebet this, this is before the Chebotarov uh, density theorem, and uh, uh, certainly uh, the Chebotarov theorem, well, let me just say it gives you more information. It doesn't give it so these uh, going into factoring into cycles. That's a conjugacy class in the permutation group. The Chebotarov theorem tells you about conjugacy classes in, in the group itself. So, so what does this say? It says that um, if you have an element in your group that has a certain cycle decomposition, eventually you will get a witness of that. You go out far enough, there'll be a prime, so that when you reduce mod p, you get a factorization of that form. Okay. So um, uh, th this, this says that by factoring, going mod p for a lot of primes and factoring, you'll, you'll get a sense of uh, what kind of elements are in your group. Okay. So um, for instance, if there is an n cycle in your group, this says eventually by factoring, you'll get to a prime where the, the polynomial is still irreducible. Or if there's a, if it's a polynomial of odd degree and there's a two cycle in your group, eventually you'll get to a point where the, um, there'll be a factor of order two. So um, this, what are the advantages of thinking in this way? Well, first of all, it's easy to factor mod p. And this is a, a result due to Berlekamp, who gave a, uh, in the 67, a very nice algorithm, how to quickly, really, really quickly factor mod p. And uh, this approach gives, gives good probabilistic tests for um, uh, determining whether your, your group is the, the full symmetric group or the alternating group, which more than likely it is. <laughs> So, uh, and it, it gives good evidence for other groups. So it's, you want to start calculating Galois groups, you know, start factoring for a few hundred primes. And you'll, you'll get a sense, at least uh, one can get a sense for, for what, what group you possibly have, or at least exclude other groups. So the disadvantage is, is it's an asymptotic result. So I said that if you have a certain cycle decomposition of an element in your group, eventually there'll be a prime that, that witnesses that. Um, and, and we have um, estimates for that, but, but they aren't really good enough to uh, give you a, a fast algorithm. The other problem is that um, the groups are not determined by the distribution of their cycle patterns, that you can have groups where the number of elements with a given cycle pattern are the same in both groups, but they're not the same group. And this already happens in degree eight. So, um, but still, as, as, a, as a way to get your hands on, on things, it's good. So that's, that's one technique. Another technique is uh, invariant theoretic techniques. And this certainly goes back to um, the ancients. Um, so let, let me start with a well-known example. This is the example of uh, the cubic. How do you determine the Galois group of a, of a cubic? Well, um, first thing you ask, can you factor it? Well, if you can factor it, if it has just uh, one, root, group, one root, then the Galois group is just S2. Uh, if it has three roots, it's the identity. Okay, so you start by factoring it. Now assume it's, it's irreducible, then um, that says that the Galois group acts transitively on the roots. So from group theory, well, that 
it's overstating it a little bit, but from group theory, uh, we know that the transitive subgroups of the symmetric group are S3 and A3. So you have to distinguish between these two groups. Okay. So I'm going to now construct a polynomial. It's uh, z squared minus the discriminant. And we know that um, the uh, alternating group leaves the square root of the discriminant fixed, but the symmetric group doesn't. So the Galois group is going to be um, the alternating group, if and only if this new polynomial factors. So I mean, you've, you've seen this perhaps in a, stated in a slightly different way, but what I want to underline is that we're reducing the calculation to Galois of Galois groups to factorization properties of not just the original polynomial, but polynomials that we calculate uh, some, in some other way, associated polynomials. And the question is, why does this work? I mean, why, why, why should one even start thinking about these things? And I, I'd like to address that question. And it depends on two facts. And the first is that a group is determined by its permutation representations. And this is um, very much in the spirit of uh, Grotendieck and the Galois categories. But, but for me, uh, in a very concrete way, I just want to, to say that this means that if you have two groups, a group and its subgroup, you can always find a permutation representation so that the big group acts transitively and the little group doesn't. And in fact, it's easy. You let the group act on itself by multiplication on one side or the other. Um, the group acts transitively on itself, but any subgroup will leave that subgroup fixed under multiplication. So it's not going to act transitively. So in fact, there's one representation that distinguishes the group from all its subgroups by saying here, the, the group is transitive, but none of the subgroups are. So, um, of course, that's some enormous representation. One would like to find smaller representations. The second fact is that um, you don't have to look in strange places for your permutation representations. You get them in the Galois extension already. So what I mean is if I have a representation of the Galois group as a permutation group, then um, I can find elements in the field in the Galois extension such that um, the permutation, act, the, the Galois group acts on these elements via this, this kind of permutation. So, so how does that help us? So um, the, uh, remember I had uh, A3 and S3. There was this uh, permutation representation on two elements, U and V, such that A3 left um, these elements fixed and S3 permuted them. These were the square root of the discriminant and minus the square root of the discriminant. And sure enough, they lie in my Galois extension. So, so what does one do? You, you want to test whether you have a group. You think your Galois group is a certain group. You, do the, you can do the following. So you want to distinguish your group from possible subgroups. So you think your Galois group is this, this group. So for each of, let's say, a maximal subgroup, so for here, you find a representation so that the group acts on the representation transitively, but the subgroup doesn't. And I said one could find that in, in the, the Galois extension itself. You write down a polynomial whose roots are this. So, so this is my polynomial f of x. And um, this will factor when the group doesn't act transitively, and it'll be irreducible when the group acts transitively. And uh, this, this works a lot of times. You need to know a lot about your groups. 
uh, transitive subgroups of um, the symmetric group, I think, are classified up to degree 35. I'm told that this idea works for polynomials up to degree 20-something, 20 23, 24. And um, this, is, this, is what, this is what can be done, certainly using uh, uh, magma. So, um, well, there's a lot more to say about uh, the, the usual Galois theory, but I'm going to, to stop here. But I would like to say that um, these ideas, these two ideas are... Um, uh, from a computational point of view, what, what I get out of um, this uh, Grotendieck theory of Galois categories. There are many other uses of it, but anyway. Okay, differential Galois groups. So, uh, Malgrange and other people spoke about this. I, I only want to talk about the linear theory, and uh, I want to give a, a quick introduction to it as well, just to nail down some definitions. Um, again, I'm going to, well, I'll first talk about what these things are and what, what good are they, and then again talk about some aspects of what we can do in theory and what we can do in practice. So here's the uh, quick introduction to the picard vessio theory. Let's start with a, a linear differential equation. I'm going to, to simplify things. Think of it as having coefficients that are rational functions with complex uh, uh, entries, coefficients. Um, in, in Galois theory, at least nowadays, what we do is we form splitting fields and automorphism groups and so on. So I want to form a splitting field. One can not do this constructively, but certainly in theory, there exists, you go to some nice regular point, there exist independent solutions. And you can form a splitting field by adjoining these solutions to the base field, rational functions. And you also want to adjoin their derivatives, the first derivative, second derivatives, and you keep adjoining derivatives. Once you get up to the n minus first derivative, you get the nth derivative for free because these things satisfy a differential equation. So higher derivatives come for free. <laughs> the picard vessio group is going to be the group of automorphisms of this large extension k over uh, little k, which I haven't defined. So little k is the rational functions. And uh, I don't want just field theoretic automorphisms, I want those automorphisms which commute with the derivation. So I want them to preserve um, derivatives. So the first thing to notice is that this, because they preserve derivatives, this, this group of automorphisms will take the vector space of solutions to itself, and it will be, each automorphism will be a linear map on that vector space. So you can identify, once you've chosen a basis, this group with a subgroup of invertible n by n invertible matrices. And one can show that um, it's Zariski closed, meaning there's some set of polynomials and n squared variables such that this group of matrices is the set of matrices whose entries satisfy those collection of polynomials. So for example, that the determinant minus one is zero, that's a polynomial in n squared variables. So this is a, uh, a it's, it's a group of matrices, but it's, it has, it's not just any group of matrices. And finally, there's a Galois correspondence um, between certain subgroups and certain subfields. The certain subgroups are subgroups that are also Zariski closed, defined by sets of polynomials. And they correspond in the usual Galois correspondence to subfields which are also closed under derivation. So this is the, the Galois theory. So what's the point? Why is one interested? Well, for example, um, in the usual Galois theory, the size of the group measures the size of the extension. That is, 
the, the physical size of the group is the linear dimension of the extension. And here, the, the natural generalization of this is true. The size of the group, meaning its dimension as a variety, or Lie group, is equal to the transcendence degree of the big field over the small field. And this is very useful in, in uh, number theory and number th or in other places. One is interested in, in showing that values of certain functions are transcendental. The usual first step in this is to show that the functions themselves are transcendental. And so, for example, if you look at the uh, Bessel equation, and which has a parameter lambda, and you put a restriction on lambda, one can show that the, the Galois group is the uh, special linear group. I have left out a derivative here. There should be a y prime. Um, and uh, the special linear group has dimension 3, so these four functions, any three of them are going to be algebraically independent. Uh, another thing you can measure is solvability, just like the usual Galois theory. Um, so I'm going to say uh, an equation is solvable in terms of Liouvillean functions. And here's something that is named after somebody who actually introduced the notion. So this is... Uh, one goes back to Leoville to, to, to see this, although perhaps not quite in this algebraic form. Um, just as in the usual Galois theory, it's in terms of towers of fields. And um, you, you have a tower of field where each one is gotten from the previous one by either adjoining something algebraic over the previous one, an integral of something from the previous field, or an exponential of an integral. Okay. And we say that uh, the equation is solvable precisely when your equation has a full set of solutions in such an extension. So uh, here's, here's an equation, um, a differential equation. And I've uh, um, <coughs> expressed the solutions as e to the integral of square root of x and e to minus that integral. And I've exhibited a tower which shows you that, in fact, this has Liouvillean solutions. And uh, the Galois group measures this. That is, um, the, the theorem about solvability in this context is that a group is solvable. Uh, I'm sorry, an equation is solvable in these terms if and only if, well, I'd like to say that the, the group itself is solvable. It's almost true. The group has some subgroup of finite index that's solvable. And uh, in fact, the, the equation that I've written down, its group is, uh, it is solvable. It's the group of um, diagonal matrices of determinant 1 union the anti-diagonal matrices of determinant minus 1. OK, so that's the introduction to the Galois theory. Now, um, what's, what's, what can we calculate? And, and this, this actually has a long history. There's a, a wonderful book by Jeremy Gray on uh, about linear differential equations that, that outlines this history. And I, I just want to quickly talk a little bit about what was done in the 19th century and what's done in the 20th century. So, so the first uh, thing is one can decide if linear differential equations have a basis of algebraic solutions. It's a very special case of the Liouvillean solutions. And work on this was done by Schwartz. Schwartz made a list of the hypergeometric equations that have algebraic solutions. Uh, Pépin, uh, subsequent to this, um, and I'll talk about him a little bit later, gave a, uh, an algorithm which reproduced Schwartz's list, or has some gaps. Fuchs thought about this. He published papers on very special equations having special groups. And Klein showed that if you have any second order equation that has only algebraic solutions, so second order, only algebraic solutions, it comes from Schwartz's list by a change of the independent variable. Okay. And uh, 
in the uh, uh, 70s, Baldessari and Dwork uh, turned this into an algorithm. And this, this has been further worked on by many people here, Mark Van Hue, uh, Mark Van Hui, uh, Jacques Durval, and other people. So um, for higher order equations, this was looked at by uh, Jordan. And in fact, Jordan has a very famous theorem in group theory that says that if you have a finite subgroup of the general linear group, then it has a very large abelian subgroup. I don't want to say exactly what his theorem is. And this, boy, you, you look at groups, uh, books on group theory, and you see this theorem again and again. And in fact, this theorem was uh, published in a paper devoted to, um, whose title, well, was uh, uh, in English, a, a memoir on equations, linear differential equations that have algebraic integrals. There's no mention of group theory in the title, although. I think what's mainly known from that paper is, is the group theory. So Jordan looked at that. And then this was looked at by Boulanger and Penlevé. Boulanger was a student of Penlevé, although if you look at the words, it probably should be the other way around. Um, and um, they also considered this problem. And they were looking for algorithms. And um, they almost had algorithms. There was a missing fact that they uh, couldn't deal with at, at the time. And that missing fact was uh, what I think um, Langer calls the problem of Abel. Let me say what that is. So you have uh, y, an algebraic function. And the question is, is e to the integral of y algebraic? And um, they weren't able to, to solve this problem. They knew it was a problem. And um, as far as I know, this was only solved in the 70s by Robert Risch in his uh, work on integration in finite terms. And um, he reduced this. So you want to bound the torsion of uh, a, or the Jacobian of a curve defined over some number field. And uh, he solved this. Uh, one can do this by effectively by um, this problem by reducing the curve for two primes, two good primes, where the Jacobian reduces in a nice way. It becomes then some finite group, which you can calculate and bound the, the torsion. So I don't want to get into it. There are people who know this better than I do. But here, here's you know, modern mathematics at work solving a very classical problem. Um, so let me quickly go through the problem, the general problem of uh, solvable in terms of Liouvillean functions was um, looked at by Liouville for n equals 2, who characterized what can happen without group theory. And uh, Pepin gave uh, an algorithm. Liouville's work, by the way, is in the uh, 1830s. All this other work is in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. Liouville was quite a bit ahead of his time in this, as well as many other areas. Um, this was turned into a, an algorithm by Kovacek in the 70s, although published much later. For higher order, the old guys looked at it also. Again, they ran into this kind of a problem. Uh, Marat worked out many cases, n equals 3, 4, 5, by knowing the groups. And a, a general algorithm was, was given by myself. and. Uh, improved by Ulmer and other people. For n equals 3, for n equals 2 and 3, this, what, it's been programmed. One can calculate things. One can uh, characterize when groups, when equations are solvable in terms of smaller order linear equations. And most recently, 
the last year or two, Mark Van Huy and his students actually can take an equation and tell you, can it be solved in terms of Bessel functions? Can it be solved in terms of airy equations? And this is, has um, nice applications to understanding formulas and combinatorics. And finally, in uh, 2002, <laughs> Ruschowski gave an algorithm to, to compute the Galois group. And um, I would say that this is at the stage of where we are, where Kronecker was. It's not an algorithm you would want to, to implement, but it it's certainly uh, is, is a, a wonderful and interesting algorithm. So I will take uh, two, two more minutes and um, tell you about what is done in practice. And let me say that what is, is done in practice nowadays is strongly influenced by the theory of Tanakian categories. And so I want to tie this with um, the talk that was given on Tanakian categories. So the ideas are based on, on this philosophy. And I say philosophy because I don't want to state any theorems. Once again, a linear group is determined by its representations in the sense that you start with the group, you look at all its representations. These are vector spaces on which the group acts. There are subspaces which are invariant. You can form products, direct sums, various things. You have maps between these vector spaces that preserve the group action. Now forget the group. And just look at this category of vector spaces with this, these designated maps and constructions. From that, well, that determines the group. That if somehow you have two categories that look the same, that you knew came from a group, then the groups they came from must be the same. So saying in another way, you can recover the group from its category of finite dimensional G modules. And the finite dimensional G modules, all of them you can get from one. You have one faithful G module by various linear algebra constructions, you can get all of these. The next important fact, and this is the key, is that a linear differential equation is an avatar for its representation theory. So um, I looked up the, the definition of avatar. And um, what I mean is uh, it, it's, uh, it's the embodiment of the representation theory, but in some other form. Okay, So what do I mean by that? If I start with the um, differential equation, form this extension, look at the solution space, then for any other G module, or for any other representation, I can take my solution space, do something algebraic to it to construct this. But what's more important is I could start with my original equation and do something to it so that the new equation I get, its solution space will be this new representation. So whatever I could have done with the representations, I can do with the equation. And so these, these two results are the, I'd say, the fundamental theorem of Tanakian categories in this setting. So what does this mean? I have one more slide and then I'll finish. So for example, uh, if I take my solution space and I see, oh yeah, there's an invariant subspace here. Well, that corresponds to my original equation having a factor. And the factor solution space is the subspace. If I have two solution spaces, um, let's say whose intersection is trivial, I can form the direct sum that corresponds to the solution space of the least common left multiple of my operators. And I can do things like uh, form symmetric products. On the representation theory side, I can form an <laughs> operator whose solution space is a symmetric product. Now, a group is determined by all these representations. That means I can distinguish it from its subgroups by looking at representations. And that would mean, in terms of the operator, I can distinguish the, the group from its subgroup by looking at properties of operators I construct. So here are some results, and this will be my final slide. An equation is solvable in terms of Liouvillean functions, if and only if, when I construct this new operator, operator whose solution space is the sixth symmetric power, 
This will be an operator of order seven, if and only if it factors. We'll write it as a composition. Another example, here's an example of a specific group, the central extension of the alternating group on six elements that lies in SL3. I have a third order equation. Is this, um, does this equation have this as its group? Well, I have to look at several things. The second symmetric power, the third symmetric power. Are they irreducible? How does the fourth symmetric power factor? But it's this Tanakian view of life that forces you to think in these terms. And then, of course, you need group theory and representation theory to work out special cases to, to, to make it work. So um, I, I've uh, abused my, my privilege here and run over, run over time, but I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Il y a une autre chambre aujourd'hui? Non. Ah oui. Yeah, the question is whether one can factor differential polynomials as efficiently as uh, yeah. usual. So um, there, there are good heuristic methods. But uh, the, the complexity of, of a general method that I know was analyzed several years ago by Dima Grigoriev. And the general method, the, the upper bound on the complexity is doubly exponential. It's a real disaster. So again, in practice, good heuristic methods will work. And um, uh, in theory, regrettably, we're still kind of at the chronicer stage of life. Um, so, so the question is, is, is there something like a Schwartz list in general? And um, people have thought about this for third order equations. It's, it's rather complicated. It isn't as simple. And in general, well, I don't know, but I'm, I'm skeptical. So uh, things, uh, so uh, second order, the, the thing about the Schwartz list is that uh, the hypergeometric equations are determined by local phenomena. That is the, the, the local monodromy. And this isn't true in general. And as, as one goes to higher equi order equations, life gets worse and worse. So in my mind, for that reason, I have a feeling that things are much more complicated. Um, do you know any algorithms that may apply to function fields, like uh, analyzing the Galois group of an, of an extension of C of X, for example? Um, so, so the short answer is, is, is no, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with that. Many of these techniques, certainly the representation theoretic techniques, work. And the key is that, you know, if you have an equation, the only thing you can do with it is factor it. I mean, if you think about it, this, you, you think you can adjoin roots, you think you can do that, but it's just uh, um, you're, you're deluding yourself. The only thing that you can do is, is factor. And once you have good factorization algorithms, the, this idea of using the representation theory to calculate the group and using the, the category of representations and their relations to their invariant subspaces will let you calculate the group. So, but, but I don't know of uh, um, any uh, explicit algorithms other than, than what I spoke of. There are some analytical uh, description of the differential Galois group, for instance, through this Ramis theorem. So, 
uh, can it be used to make practical computation? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is one of the things that, that I, I ignored. Um, so there are uh, a finite collection of objects that generate a dense subgroup. Uh, several of these objects can be computed explicitly and several numerically. And uh, I guess, uh, Michelle O'Day, you, you've worked on this with some of your students and uh, quite successfully. And also, even theoretically, for example, uh, a calculation of an equation whose group is G2, I guess uh, this was done with Claude Michis thesis together with Anne Duval. So it, it's been done. I don't know of any algorithms, but it's, uh, one can, can approach this that way. Thank you.